Hi everyone, welcome back to this series of PMP practice questions, perfect for preparing for your PMP exam, and especially in this case, we're looking at waterfall questions, which you will definitely still see on the exam, and especially you will also see in your real project world, uh, project management career in the real world as well. Uh, so something really, really important to go through, some wonderful scenario-based questions, just like you'll see on the real P P PMP exam. It's gonna be a whole bunch of fun. We've got 10 questions in this little section. Let's get into it. You have planned, executed, and monitored a project to completion. The customer has just received the finished product and would like to close the project. Okay, very nice. The customer advises you that they're not happy with the received project uh, product. Oh, that's not, okay. That's a little bit less than good <laughs> for us. And that your team didn't listen when they raised quality concerns and that they are raising a claim against your company. What will you do next? Okay, unhappy customer, but most specifically, they are raising a claim. So, uh, you know, that's what happens when vendors are working with customers. Uh, that's the process they can go through if they, if they believe that it's not what they want to deliver. So they can raise a claim against, uh, against that project. So what do we need to do here? raise a change request for their proposed changes and update the project plan. Well, the project's pretty much finished. So the claims, I think there's something better on the claims process potentially. Let's leave that as a maybe for now. Um, call their bluff, take the claim to a dispute and then appeal if necessary. Um, again, you know, that's one option we do have. We could do that, but potentially there might be better options here. Let's leave that as a maybe for now as well. Uh, review the claims process, okay, that sounds a bit more promising, in the contract and negotiate with them to settle the claim. Now that sounds a lot more promising. So we need to know what the process is for the claims process. And then we need to use our negotiating power and influencing power as project managers um, and our communicating power and conflict management power, all of these beautiful things that you learn in the PMBOK guide and throughout your project management career those things we need to put them into practice. I think this one sounds quite good. Let's see what the last one is just in case. Review the earned value management report, uh, earned value report for any impact to the schedule and cost of your project. Again, might be a little bit too late for that as we're almost complete with our project. Let's go with answer C. And there, that one is fantastic. The claims handling process is outlined in the procurement contract and the preferred way to handle claims is to settle the claims through negotiation. So, you know, we might need to give up a little, they might need to give up a little, we need to negotiate and find the best way forward. Page 498 under claims administration in the Pumba Guide 6th edition uh, from 2017, a wonderful guide on the waterfall ways of working. Again, with a little bit of agile thrown in there for good measure. How did you guys go with that one? That was a good one to start. I thought that was fantastic. Hopefully they're all like this, but we'll soon find out. You're in the process of creating a project charter for your organization. Okay, project charter to try and gain resources for an automated process improvement. Great. The project sponsor is also the functional manager in charge of the resources for that area. That usually will happen. You'll see that a lot. And she rejects your project charter. Okay. Noting that you have outlined everything you want from her team, but nothing about what her area will get in return. Okay. This is that give and take, you know, maybe a little negotiation here as well. I wonder what our answers are going to look like. Uh, what are we going to do next? What will we do about this? So rework the project charter to include the benefits management plan and success measures. Oh, that actually sounds fantastic. So maybe that's the one benefits management. What are the benefits that they're getting? She needs to know. What are the success measures? How do we know if it's been successful? She needs to know that as well, I think. Um, I think those two are actually pretty good. So those go into the project charter. This could work. Let's see what else we have just in case we've missed something. Escalate the project charter to the project sponsor's manager as this project is important. Uh, I think we'd only do that as a last resort and maybe even then that option may not be available to us. So, uh, you know, you might have this scenario in the real world, but for our scenario here, not quite just yet. We'd go through many other steps before this one. Ask the project sponsor to work agile and start delivering a minimum viable product. Uh, you know, that is something we could do, deliver something, um, but again, our project sponsor wants to know what she's getting. You know, uh, we can probably, we don't have to deliver something to be able to tell her that the benefits that they're getting. 
Begin work on the requirements management plan as this will show the sponsor how their requirements will be added and tracked. So the requirements through to scope, through to project delivery um, and completion. Um, that's a pretty good one, but again, for benefits and success measures, I think that's probably better at this stage in the early stage of the project charter. Requirements management plan, we might work on that when we're planning our project once the project has been initiated through a project charter. So we need to do that first. All right, let's go with answer A. And there it is. We had to talk that one through a little bit. That was uh, pretty good. <laughs> so the project charter will ideally have the project benefits management plan. There it is, that's what we're looking for, including the target benefits, strategic alignment, and time frame for realizing them. This may include success measures such as return on investment, ROI, or the payback period. So how long does it take if we've spent uh, you know, this amount of dollars how long does it take to realize that value and earn our money back from the project? Pumbok Guide, page 343 and 344 under Project Success Measures if you want to check that out for yourself. That was really, really fantastic. All right, this is a good bunch of questions, this one. Let's see what else we've got. You're working on a complex, high value project to replace the telecommunication system across your organization. That sounds massive. Uh, have definitely been through something like this before myself and you know oh, these things can get huge and very complex as well. You've created a request for quote for vendors to respond to including source selection criteria, okay, request for quote, great, and a statement of work. And you've already selected a seller, okay, fantastic, based on multiple vendor responses. So we've selected a seller, do they just need to go ahead? Let's see what we've got. What will you do next? Um, including, so we've created a request for quote and then we've selected a seller. Maybe we need a, an agreement or a, a contract at this point. Let's see. Record the new vendor in your stakeholder register. Okay, I mean, that's a potentially, we might need to do that actually. Um, and begin engaging them to deliver the project. I don't think we can do that part yet. So that, let's put that as a low maybe for now. Draft an appropriate contract such as fixed price incentive fee to proceed with the implementation. That sounds pretty promising to me. Okay, let's put that as a, as a high maybe for that. Repl oh, place the approved request for quote in your procurement management plan and proceed with the delivery of the project. Again, I think we could do the first part of this, but the second part, we can't proceed yet. I feel like we need to do something else, potentially with a contract here. Um, so I think, yeah, let's put that as a no for now. Approach organizational senior management for approval to award the contract. Ah, oh, gosh, okay. Um, so that, is that like escalating uh, the, this scenario to senior management for approval to award the contract? Let's see, does it give us any clues here? Uh, so complex, high value project. So, oh, this could be actually a bit tricky. Do we just create a contract or do we get approval first? Um, so we're definitely ready for either of those two things. Oh, this is very tricky. Uh, gosh, okay, I think I'm gonna go with the contract on this one um, and let's see how we go because I think we're ready. Um, and then I think this is more like escalating a risk. So let's go with answer B for now. Oh no, we got one wrong. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Answer D. Oh, this is good. Now, this is going to give us some tips for the PMP exam so you don't make this mistake on the exam yourself. Let's see what we've got here. So, final approval of complex. Okay, it was a clue. Complex, high value, high risk procurements will generally require organizational senior management approval prior to award. So, we can't award them anything actually yet. And then once we do award them, then we can have that contract, you know, you know signed, uh, created and drafted up, and then they can sign the contract and proceed. So I did, I jumped the gun a little bit too much there for this one, and the clue was complex, high value, and maybe high risk could have mentioned. They could have thrown us another clue. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So Pimbok Guide, 488, conduct procurement outputs, selected sellers in the Pumbok Guide. Check that out for yourself. That's gonna be really, really good. All right, wow. 
I'm learning something. I hope you're learning something. This is a little bit more fun than I was expecting. Let's see what we've got next. You have been planning your project using a waterfall methodology and need to estimate the resources required with your team. Your project management office recently stopped using third parties or off-site workers, okay, and mandated resources to be on-site only. Okay, is this about resource management maybe? Let's have a look. You review the activity list based on your project scope and realize that some essential project resources currently work off-site. So we need to bring workers on-site. However, some of our really, really high value essential workers are actually working off-site. So this is a tricky situation. What are we gonna do here? What will we do next? Discuss the available options with the project sponsor. That could be good, could be pretty good. Uh, I wonder if we've got any better options there though. Let's have a look. Because uh, it may not just be the project sponsor either. Uh, so that's something to consider. Perform alternatives analysis on the impact of both on-site and off-site workers for the project. So I like this because we'd probably do this before we actually went to discuss this with anyone. We want to have all that information. Is it actually going to impact us? Maybe not. What are the alternatives and, you know, and how do they impact us? I think we need to know this. I like this one so far. Update the resource management plan with the on-site worker mandate. Resource management plan, uh, that's more how, uh, how we're going to manage our resources. We could put that in there, that's, that's an okay one. Probably not the best one for now. We might need to discuss the options first, so that's good. Update the resource calendar with the available people, locations and dates before baselining your project plan. So I think we'd probably do this one first, then we'd talk to the project sponsor, then we'd update the resource management plan, and then we'd update the resource calendar. So I think in that order, if we're actually looking at that, this is pretty good, it gives us a few clues for the future as well. Let's go with answer B. Okay, phew, I was actually worried about that one after the last question too. <laughs> so I'm like, how many am I gonna get wrong now? Uh, okay, all of these are good options. However, the best option is alternatives analysis as part of all of these things, which assists in providing the best solution to perform the project activities with the defined constraints. So we need to know what the alternatives are, what the impacts are. Page 325, estimate resources, data analysis. And anytime we lose, we don't lose the lesson. That's the most important thing. Even though getting things wrong is a little bit painful, we get the benefit of getting the lesson out of that as well. And then we can take that to the exam and win! You guys can do it. All right, we're halfway through. You've been working on a project where the organization wanted only on-site workers. This sounds familiar. While you believed the project needed specific skills that were only available off-site. Is this exactly the same question? Hmm, or is this the same scenario? You worked through the various options and agreed to use the on-site workers available. That's what happened. Okay, I feel like we're going somewhere else here. As your project progresses, however, it becomes clear that it is not being done to specification and you really do need the off-site workers. We were right all along. Okay, oh, what do we do? Do, do we stick it to the people who said to do it the other way? <laughs> Let's see what our options are here. The project is going off track. What are we going to do? So now we have to, this is, you know, and you'll see this happen in the real world as well. This is tricky, it's a tricky scenario. Um, we have to be mature and we have to work through this because it's an issue and a conflict and a problem. How are we gonna do this? Update the issue log. Okay, well it is an issue, yes, maybe. And the resource calendar with the resource requirements. Again, I think we still need to work through this. So there might be a better option. That could be a high maybe for now. Use problem solving with your team and negotiation with the project sponsor. Oh, that actually sounds very good because we need to problem solve now that we're going off track, definitely. And we might need to negotiate with the project sponsor to say, you know what, we do need, or we might need some offsite workers in some scenarios. Um, and here are the reasons why. Um, and again, we'll have a little bit of back and forth and giving and taking. I think that could be our one. Let's see what else. Gather work performance information from your team and raise a change request. Uh, this is probably more about resources, I think, so not just yet. 
uh, and it probably would happen later as well. Raise a risk in the risk register and brainstorm risk responses with your team. Risks are things that could happen in the future that we see happening out there uh, you know, in the future. Uh, this is already happening, I think. So if it's issues or problem solving, out of these two, um, just because of this second bit here, I probably like problem solving with where we agree with both bits, negotiating and problem solving. Let's go with answer B and fingers crossed. Okay, excellent. I think we're getting back into the rhythm here. This is good. Uh, this question is referring to the tools and techniques when used when monitoring and controlling resources. These techniques include problem solving and negotiation. A change request is for impacted baseline items, impacting schedule or cost, so not quite for us in this one, page 356 and 357, problem solving and interpersonal and team skills in the Pumba Guide, sixth edition. Wonderful stuff, absolutely wonderful. All right, and you know what else is great? We're halfway through this little section. You guys are doing great, keep going. This is your great preparation for your exam. You're doing the right thing. You're working on a very high infrastructure project that is critical to your organization. Not another one. Oh, are we going to have to you know, escalate this to senior management as well? Oh, that one really got me. Um, the team are experienced in this area after working on this project for the past 12 months. Okay, this is great. Is it analogous estimating? We've seen that in the, in the previous questions, haven't we? During a working group meeting, they mentioned they're stuck and can't implement part of the project. You raise an issue in the issue log and decide to problem solve with your team. Okay, what are we going to do next? They're experienced, but they're stuck. We're going to problem solve. How do we do that? Okay, do we escalate the problem outside your team as they clearly cannot move forward? I think a low maybe for that one because we need to work through a few other options first. We really need to problem solve first. And as a last result, maybe we go outside the team. Review the lessons learned register for lessons to past similar problems. Yeah, that could be a, like a, a maybe for that one as well. I think that's pretty good. Um, I wonder if there's better options though. You know, I mean, if, if there's nothing left, we'll go with that one. Um, define the problem with data. Oh, I love that already. Identifying the root cause. I love that as well. And generating possible solutions that we can choose from. Okay, all three, th three of those things are actually pretty good. So I think that's gonna be, uh, that could be our one there. Raise a risk to project delivery and note the impact and likelihood of the risk. That's the risk process, certainly, um, but for our purposes, it's already happening again, probably more of an issue, um, and we wanna problem solve that with real data, with the root causes, the actual causes, and potential solutions that we can work with. Let's go with answer C. There it is. This question asks for an approach to solving quality problems. We know the team are experienced in this area. Going outside the team might actually complicate things more. That's good to know, um, as people might be less familiar with the options. Uh, various problem solving methods generally include defining the problem with data, finding the root cause, generating solutions to choose from and test or even prioritize with your customers. Page 295 and 356, problem solving and oh, lots of problem solving in the Pumbok Guide. Two sections there, that's very handy. It must be important and it is. All right, what else is important? Last four questions, let's get into these. You are creating a high level project charter which has now been approved. The project sponsor expects you to get this work, get to this work straight away um, and you don't know who to approach or who is available to help you with this project. So project charter, we don't know who to approach. What do we do next? Identify, okay, and what are the steps here? So project charter to kick off and initiate a project, and then right down at the bottom of, um, of all of the process steps in the process group mapping in the Pumbok Guide, you've got identify stakeholders. And then it goes all the way back up here to starting your project management plan and all of the project management plan steps in planning your project. So do we have anything around identifying the people that we need to help us? Identifying stakeholders with an organizational breakdown chart and include this in your project plan. I think that's actually pretty good. Uh, and that's probably identifying stakeholders. That's the step, the process step. So uh, create a RACI or a resource assignment matrix. Um, I think we need to identify them first, don't we? So potentially not there yet. Review and update the resource calendar, 
probably not there yet either. Review the high level stakeholders in the project charter Ooh, and begin your project. That also is a good one, but is that enough information? If we were to choose between that one and this one here, getting all of those stakeholders, now that we can delve into it in a bit more detail, with an organizational breakdown chart, who's here, you know, who's under them as a team leader, who's in that team, who's in this team. Uh, so that's the information that we need, I think. Let's go with answer A. There it is. The next step after creating the project charter is to identify stakeholders with one of many being an organizational breakdown chart. There is no point in updating resource calendars or creating a RACI when you don't know who is involved yet. Very good call. Page 316 uh, under data representation and page 25 under process group and knowledge area mapping in the Pumbuk guide. Excellent work guys. This is great. All right, you're doing great. Let's get to these last questions. You have been assigned to address the fast moving competition that is rapidly taking market share from your company. Your executive manager advises you that the company only has 12 months before jobs will be lost, but there are currently no projects to address these concerns. As a project manager, what will you do next? So we need to create a business case or a project charter maybe. Uh, let's see what we've got. Ask the executive manager to come up with the project ideas to address the situation. Um, you know, maybe they might have some ideas, but I think we might have more tools as project managers to prioritize um, and to use that analysis, you know, very, uh, the different alternatives analysis that we looked at before. Um, so this might be one input into that, but maybe not the whole thing. Let's put that as a maybe for now. Perform benchmarking against various companies for process improvement opportunities. That's a high maybe, I like that one, because uh, that's gonna give us the ideas into creating our um, business case or project charter. Um, I wonder if there's a better one though, let's see. Create a project charter with a high level scope, milestones and cost for approval. That's a definite yes, but we still need to go through benchmarking first, I think. Create a project business case. Oh, okay, oh gosh, there's a few good options here. Including the business need, yes. The situation analysis, yes. And solution options, yes to that as well. Oh, this is tricky. So benchmarking, the benchmarking options will go into those solution options. So does D take the cake here? I think the best answer for us overall, I think based on that, let's go with answer D. Okay, excellent. Oh, that was tricky. Gosh, I just realized, you know, could have gotten that one wrong too. <laughs> Especially when there's a few different correct answers. Very, very tricky. Before a project charter can be created, it needs a business case to determine how the project will address the business goals and the strategy, um, an analysis of the situation, various options to address them. Benchmarking is also a good answer, but not as complete as the business case. Page 30 and 31 under project business case in the Pumbok guide. Excellent work. All right, last two questions, guys. You're doing great. You have just started work in a project that has been in development for the past six months. You notice it has been through a large amount of project steps that you are unfamiliar with, such as concept development, feasibility study, commissioning, milestone review, and more. These don't match the normal phases of design, build, and test. So you'll find them you know, pretty much everywhere. Maybe they can fit into those phases though. So, oh, okay, what are we gonna do here? This is a bit of a tricky one. Uh, advise the project to reduce and update its phases for less admin and faster delivery. Mm, I don't know, that's a bit ambiguous. Let's put that as a maybe for now. Ask the project to adhere to the normal phases of design, build and test. Uh, as per the Pumbok guide. And so we've just started in this project, remember? So this is a bit tricky. Do we just go in and dictate all these changes? I'm not sure here. Adhere to the project's phases, or do we just do everything as the project says? Oh, maybe there's a middle ground, I'm not sure. Um, and familiarize yourself with the organization's process. Okay, um, you know, maybe that actually is the answer because you know, these things still could be valid. These, as long as it's going through the steps in some way, shape or form, these things actually could match up. So this could be a bit, it's just, they're just named differently, for example. And you'll see this, this is part of organizational, uh, no, enterprise environmental 
factors, EEFs. So the organization is the environment that we're working in. We need to you know, come to understand what that environment is and how it works and how it operates. And this could be part of that. Uh, remove the phases altogether and work through the waterfall delivery in one big release. Um, I think, well, let's not mandate, let's not dictate. Let's work with these guys, especially for the, the information about enterprise environmental factors and the environment that we're working in. Let's go with answer C. Okay, phew, that was also a bit tricky. We're referring to project phases, but also <laughs> enterprise environmental factors. Hooray, we got it right. Each organization can be different with different politics, ways of working, governance and approvals. The best immediate course of action is to adhere to these EEFs and familiarize yourself with the organizational best practice. Page 20 in the Pumuk Guide, sixth edition under project phase. Well done guys, and you are up to the last question in this section. You've done an amazing job. Keep going, we're nearly there. The project management office is looking to help in, for your help in hiring and coaching new project managers. And they ask you to interview the next candidate for roles in upcoming projects, okay? In speaking with the candidate, they do not have any industry experience. What will you do next? So if they don't have any industry experience, what else could they have? Maybe I think there's, so there's a strategy in the, there's leadership and then there's project management specific. Uh, that's like the talent triangle, I think, the project manager talent triangle. Um, so and that's business as well. So business. Uh, okay, well, let's see what our options are here. Ask them whether they prefer waterfall or agile to see if they work the same way as your organization. I think there's probably better things. As we saw, you could call it anything, different phases, Sometimes it doesn't matter what you call it, as long as you understand what the process steps are themselves underneath that name. So, hmm, I like that, but let's put that as a no for now. Uh, ask them whether they would like a different job within the company with less focus on industry experience. Maybe, let's see what else we have. Ask them if they can dictate and command a team to get fast results. Let's not go with that for now. As we've seen in other questions, sometimes dictating can work, but only if we need fast results at the expense of everything else. So team morale, you know, information on the product and the project. Uh, so not always the best option there. Ask them what their focus on a project would be, the schedule, selected financial reports, or the issue log. Well, if they haven't got industry experience, do we send them off? Maybe not but we can still get information, you know, how's their project management experience? So this one here, the project management uh, knowledge, I think that's what we're asking here. Let's go with answer D, and that's the one. Part of the skills of a qualified project management manager are technical project management skills, business management skills, like we said, and leadership skills. So we got that part right. The top focuses for leading project managers were the schedule, financial reports, and the issue log. Excellent, that's good to know. Something for the real world. While a dictatorship can get fast results, it's at the expense of team psychological safety and performance over the long term. Page 58, under technical project management skills. You've done an amazing job, guys. We have covered so much here, and it's really, really gonna help your exam, and also help you in the real world with all these crazy scenarios that actually you will see. It might seem crazy, but these things actually happen in the real world. Probably even crazier things happen in the real world. So I hope you've had a great time. I've certainly had an amazing time. But most of all, I truly, truly believe that you can pass the exam. Keep going, guys. You're doing the right thing. With a little bit of practice every day, I truly believe that you can do it. I hope to see you in the next video. Bye for now.